people who have been signing in, so we're going to wait about two minutes before we get started with our program, but welcome. who have been signing in, so we're going to wait about two minutes before we get started with our program, but welcome. All right, I guess we'll get started. It's seven oh four. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight to our special program, Know Our Story, the Asian American Experience in West Hartford Youth Panel. My name is Carrie Karp, and I'm the Teen Services Librarian at the West Hartford Library, and I'm very excited to be introducing this program tonight. Before we get started, I have a few thank yous and a little bit of information about programs that are happening for AAPI Month at the library. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, thank you to the AAPI Committee at the Library for planning this event tonight. Also to the West Hartford Library's Teen Advisory Board for all of your feedback and help with writing some of the questions that we will be asking. Thank you to Yukio Aida um, for organizing this program and for moderating the panel that we're having tonight, as well as the one that we're having next Friday. And also thank you to our young adult panelists, Mamata, Maya, Nathan, Natalie, Sarah, and Tiffany. We appreciate you spending your time with us tonight and sharing your stories. Um, also, as a part of celebrating AAPI Month, the library has created a book list featuring young adult AAPI books. This list will be featured on our website as well as in displays in the No Webster Library Teen Room throughout the month of May. Next week on May 21st, there will be a second Know Our Story adult panel. And on May 25th, the award-winning author Min Lei will be presenting a family read aloud and sharing personal stories virtually. Information on how to register for these programs is available in the library's newsletter. Finally, I'm happy to announce that the teen department at the library is now accepting applications for our new Mayor's Youth Council. This volunteer group will complete impact projects and communicate with town officials to voice their opinions on issues affecting youth in West Hartford. Any current students in grades eight to 11 who are interested in civic engagement and social action are encouraged to apply by May 31st. More information about this group can be seen on our website. So those are some of the things happening at the library. Now I'm gonna throw it over to Yukio, who's gonna start our presentation. Great, thank you so much, Carrie, for the introduction and all the great things that are happening at the library for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'm especially excited for the book list, um, for the, the teen section, but also for the children's section. And if you haven't had the chance to check it out, please go onto the West Hartford Library Public um, Library website and they have links to all the books that are available. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and to be a part of this wonderful panel of um, youth from our community that have been doing wonderful things. Um, my name is Yukio Ida, and I am a parent of a seventh grader at KP, one of the founding members of the West Hartford Parent Community Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Groups. I'm also the Programs and Partnership Specialist at Equity CT, and I've also had the honor to work with some of our youth um, through Equity CT as well. Um, I am an immigrant from Japan, and our 
family is a beautiful mix of race, language, and culture. And um, I am just so excited to be able to, to put on this event tonight to really showcase what we are all about. Um, and as we get ready to hear from our panelists today to commemorate and celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we also have to take time to acknowledge how this year feels different in trying to celebrate all that is us between the global pandemic, amplifying the inequities that have always existed, and our Pan-Asian community members in Atlanta, Indianapolis, California, New York, even in our local community and throughout our nation as we continue to experience the pain and harm caused by racism and gun violence. Anti-Asian racism did not start with COVID. We have been targeted repeatedly, whether it's the US government illegally annexing the Kingdom of Hawaii, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment, Vincent Chin, our South Asian Sikh and Muslim community members being targeted after 9-11, the SARS epidemic. And yet we continue to heal and grow and advocate for a just society, not only for our community, but also with others who are experiencing systemic inequities and oppression. And while this year we try to make sense of these times, we still have so much to celebrate. Kamala Harris as the VP, increasing authentic representation in books and media, um, a bill to include AAPI studies in Connecticut this legislative session, and the continued work by our youth in fighting injustices in our community and beyond. So we have a great lineup of current students and alumni from Conard and Hall this evening who will be sharing their experiences as Asian American community members in West Hartford. But before we dive in, I just want to give a little bit of context to what it means to be Asian American Pacific Islander. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and let's see, and show you some data. Oh, and technology, <laughs> hold please. I feel like this is everyone's student experience this year. <laughs> Thanks for being patient. <laughs> Here I go again. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is um, a chart uh, from the U.S. Census Bureau, and you know there are we are the fastest growing demographic group in the U.S. right now, and there are more than 22 million Asian Americans belonging to over 50 ethnic groups who speak hundreds of languages. Um, and this is a local trend too. And according to a study done by the Aurora Foundation, um, although it was from 2014. There was a 65% increase in Asian population in Hartford County from 2000 to 2014. And as you can see from this chart, <laughs> there is no one Asian American history, identity, or experience. Some of us came to the US on work and student visas. Some of us came to the US as refugees. Some of us have been here for five generations while well, some of us just got here yesterday. Um, and the, the language around how we express our Pan-Asian identity is ever evolving. Um, in, the, in the beginning, there was a very derogatory term um, being used for our community, um, and that was Oriental. And then it evolved into Asian American. Um, and then, you know, since the latest 2019 um, census data, uh, the Indian Americans or um, the South Asian community has actually edged out the Chinese Americans as the most numerous Asian American group. And, you know, to reflect that, we have new language and acronyms like APIDA, Asian Pacific Islander, Desi American, or APISA, Asian Pacific Islander, South Asian American. Um, and there's also a distinction um, as well between Asian American and Pacific Islander or Native Hawaiian. 
Um, and, and again, you know, we have various experiences with colonialism, with oppression, and we want to be really reflective of who we are, even though we are such a diverse group under this umbrella. All right, so going from the national to the hyper-local level, um, this information is from the superintendent's state of the schools presentation from this past year. Um, Asians make up about 11% of the student population in 2020. But when you tease out the two or more races, it probably bumps up the percentages a little bit. Um, I know that, you know, for our family as a mixed race family, right, we don't necessarily, or my daughter does not necessarily fall straight into the Asian category, but she is in that two or more races. Um, and West Hartford happens to have a higher percentage of Asian students as compared to the state average and our local um, surrounding communities of about 5%. And here we are, we have um, the dominant home languages. We hear the district mention the diversity of home languages spoken in West Hartford. And the top seven that we see here, four of them are the Asian languages. We have Mandarin, Vietnamese, Arabic, and Nepali. Um, and you know, when you tease out all the other ones, I'm sure there are many more Asian languages that are in that category as well. And to dive deeper into the Asian student body, um, this is the percentage of students um, that, that get English language services. So in the Asian population, 17% of students receive services for English learners. And this is for special education services. And again, of the um, 1,002 students, uh, there are 9% of students um, that get special education services. And I think this last statistic um, might come as a surprise to many. Um, and this is the student counts by race for free and reduced lunch eligibility. And in the Asian student category, 40% of our students that identify as Asian receive free and reduced lunch. So now that we've gone through some of the data and Asian students in West Hartford, um, I would love for you to meet the individuals that make up this data. Um, so here we are tonight with six amazing panelists. And um, I'll just introduce everyone one by one. And we have a list of questions for the evening. And hopefully we'll just be able to have a casual conversation with everyone and um, make sure that you know their experiences in West Hartford are heard, but also these are young people with solutions as well. So I would love to hear um, from everyone on this panel um, how we can continue to be a better Asian American community and a better West Hartford community. So thank you. All right, so number one, first student of the night is Natalie and she is a senior at Conard. Yay, thanks Natalie. Um, Tiffany is um, also a senior, but she is from Hall High School. All right, where are you? Yay, hi Tiffany. And Sarah is also a senior at Hall. Thank you. And Mamta is, um, is actually a Conard and Yukon alum. Um, and Maya is a junior at Conard. And Nathan is a senior at Conard. So we have a great wide range of um, ages and between alumni and students and experiences here. So we're gonna dive right into the questions. And the first one will be about how do you identify? And as you saw from the data, there is really such a wide range of what it means to be Asian and Asian American. So how do you identify? All right, Natalie, you wanna start us off? Absolutely. So as you mentioned, my name is Natalie Delacruz. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior at Conard and I identify as mixed race. I am half Filipina and that does cause a lot of ambiguity in the way that I look and the way that I identify. As Yukio mentioned, um, 
I and her daughter and other people, we don't fit into one box. So we often find ourselves, if there's not a two or more races box, trying to choose one that best fits us and then scrambling. But yeah, so the data I feel doesn't really represent me because I am squished into that two or more races box, which really is such a diverse group of people that it's like, I don't know how that could be one person. I mean, one group, but anyways, uh, that's how I identify. Um, I am a political activist and very big in the activism realm. And that's just a little bit about me. Great. Thank you. All right, Tiffany. Hi, my name is Tiffany Dung. Um, I identify as Vietnamese American. Um, both my parents immigrated here um, in 1997 and I am fluent in Vietnamese um, and I speak it at home. I was in the ESOL program growing up and um, I faced a lot of adversity being somebody who wasn't a native English speaker and I'm really proud that um, I can like give back to the community doing things like this. Great, thank you. I know I was also a student that went through the English language program as well. So, all right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Goldman. I'm also mixed race. I identify as half Korean and half Iranian. My parents immigrated to Canada for college and then we all immigrated from there to here in Connecticut. And I'm on the teen advisory board at the Noxter Library. Great, thank you. All right, Mamta. Oh, you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mamta. I graduated from Conard High School 2016, and I graduated from UConn last year, 2020. Um, I was born in Nepal, and I moved here when I was 10. So I, I identify as Nepali, Asian American. Um, so growing up in West Hartford has always been hard because of um, language barriers. So I was also in the ESOL program as well um, in elementary school and middle school. Uh, but I'm just happy to be here and, you know, educate others on our culture as well. Thank you. All right, Maya. Hi, my name is Maya. I'm a junior at Conard, and I identify as Indian American. Um, my grandparents both immigrated here, and my parents are first generation. Um, I'm also very active with social justice and human rights, and so I'm excited to share my experiences with you. Great. Thank you. And Nathan. Um, hi, my name is Nathan Souza. I use he, him pronouns, and I identify as Korean American. I was actually adopted when I was three months old, so it's been a while, but um, yeah, uh, I'm really active in like the theater realm in West Hartford. I do a lot with that, so um, I, I'm very excited to, you know, share my opinions on how race plays a huge part in, you know, theater and representation and stuff, so yeah, I'm excited. Great, thank you. And again, I am just so honored to share the space with everyone. Um, and, you know, some of us are immigrants, some of us were born here, um, various backgrounds. And so, you know, as we are here in West Hartford and in Connecticut, um, how do you stay connected to your culture or your heritage or, um, you know, foods, languages? If anyone wants to speak on that, feel free. Go ahead. Um, as everyone was talking about how they speak other languages or they were in the ESOL program, that made me think of something um, that I've gone through is that my parents, I mean, not my parents, I'm so sorry, my grandparents speak Tagalog, which is a language of the Philippines, but I don't speak it. And so there's always been a sort of language barrier between me and my grandparents, which has made it harder to communicate with them. Because even my father, he was an immigrant, but he learned English at a very young age and never fully learned Tagalog. So he couldn't teach it to me because he never fully learned it. So I'm not able to fully communicate with my grandparents. They speak English as well. But um, um, being able to communicate in their native tongue, I feel would help me connect to them more and my culture more. So I have always felt that that's something that would connect me to my culture more. And because um, it's not a language that's as common as Spanish, it's not on common language learning apps. So it, it's something that you really have to learn from like people. So I would really love to hear more about people who have spoken languages at home and how that helps you connect to your culture. Go ahead. Feel free. Anyone can unmute and. Um, 
I uh, stay connected uh, through my parents. So my both of my parents were born in Nepal. Um, and my younger sister, uh, one of my younger sisters, she was born in Nepal as well. And um, most of my families are in Nepal. So we talk to them on a regular basis. Of course, um, in Nepal, they don't really speak English. So we kind of have to like, you know, uh, speak in uh, Nepali. But um, it's definitely hard. Like my youngest sister was born here. Um, so she doesn't speak Nepali because, you know, she uh, speaks Nepal, uh, English fluently, but she has a hard time connecting uh, with my grandparents because, like, she's so used to, like, you know, in school, like, you're only taught, like, English. So it's, like, very hard for her to, like, um, speak Nepali, but, like, we kind of try to um, engage her in our conversation, but it's very hard. So I understand um what you were saying, it's definitely hard for my sister, but like me and my other sister, like we're like fluent in Nepali and we have a large uh, Nepali community in West Hartford now. Um, so we kind of like, you know, get together on like different festivals. Um, and that's how we like stay connected to our culture as well. Um, I think Natalie and mom, Mamta brought up a really important part about, uh, important part about um, like, having the ability to speak to your family in whatever language, like your native tongue. Um, I know a lot of my friends, uh, my Vietnamese friends, they knew Vietnamese when they were really little and then they kind of lost the ability to just because, you know, um, we don't really practice it in school or whatever. And for me, at least, I can see myself beginning to start to like lose the ability to do it as fluently. And I think that's, kind of um, something that I struggle with is finding that balance between keeping that connectiveness to my family and like um, growing my like language skills in general. And sometimes I do struggle to like figure out the right word to tell my grandparents. And then it's like, it's like a mix between English and um, Vietnamese. And I, I just think it's pretty funny. But yeah. I um, completely understand what Natalie is saying about the language barrier. Um, my grandparents speak Gujarati, and my mom does as well, but um, me and my brother, we just never really learned it. Um, and so, I mean, I wish that I knew it so I could communicate better with them. Um, but I think we have found other ways to keep like culture and our heritage alive. Um, my family still celebrates a lot of traditional holidays associated with Jainism, which is our religion. Um, and there are holidays such as Diwali and Pryushan and a lot of these types of holiday holidays that we try to celebrate, even though we aren't very religious. It's just another way to connect to our culture. Great. Um, yeah. Kind of in, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, kind of in contrast to what was just said, you know, I'm adopted, so it's been very hard to um, kind of connect and, um, you know, identify with um, my race because um, my family is Caucasian. I've lived in West Hartford for basically all of my life. So um, connecting to my own race is really about listening to other people talk about theirs. Um, and like this panel and so many other things, you know, media, culture, that helps me feel connected, even though it's not necessarily like a language or like a food connection. Um, but like panels like these are what help me, you know, not necessarily just learn specifically about Koreans, but just like the AAPI community in general. And I feel like that's how I try and stay connected um, through, you know, listening to other people's stories. Yeah, not to jump ahead too far, but I completely agree with that. As sad as everything has been, being able to have events like this and celebrate AAPI culture and go to rallies where I see so many people that look like me and have stories like mine has been so empowering. And of course, it's so sad that we had to have those rallies and those protests, but it's really helped me embrace my culture for the first time, like Nathan was saying, because I've also had the problem of like needing to learn how to be my race from other people if that makes sense like nathan was saying and so hearing other people's stories and just really taking it in has been really helpful for me great sarah did you want to say something before we um, move oh yeah just going off of that I and mean, that's like one of the reasons why it's really important to have representation of asian characters in books and on tv and pretty much everywhere 
because I think the first time I'm going to be seeing an Asian superhero on the big screen is, I don't know when um, Shang-Chi is coming out, but I think it's the next year. And the fact that it's taken more than 10 years since Marvel's founding to have an Asian superhero is pretty telling. We do need to have a lot more of that earlier so that kids growing up can, I guess, be more connected to their culture earlier on instead of seeing it as something that's a little bit more distant. Great. Thank you. And, you know, and as a teen advisory board member and having access to these books and advocating for the purchase or, you know, programming, um, really just appreciate that, that, you know, the, the library has been um, really bulking up their collection. It's something that even, you know, when my daughter was younger, like she didn't have access to a lot of these books. And so um, it's really nice to see <laughs> and like go through the book catalog and be like, I, that's a name that sounds familiar. That's a name that sounds familiar. Um, so thank you, you know, for mentioning the representation um, and just identity. So, you know, tell me about a time that, um, again, you know, that you really came to this like moment of, oh my gosh, I am Asian or, oh my gosh, like my identity is, is, is really coming into question. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's a lot of these like external comments or what people perceive you to be as that give you that feeling of, wait, what? I'm different. Um, so if anyone could, you know, share a little bit about that. All right, Nathan. Um, yeah. So, you know, throughout all of my childhood, I, I never got like malicious comments or anything, but you know, you look different from your parents, you know, all that. And that never really phased me. I guess I just wasn't really bothered by that growing up. Um, but in middle school, I went on a vacation to um, Yellowstone National Park and uh, we visited my aunt in Colorado and we stayed in RV for a week. And basically we went to a Walmart to like stock up on food and all that stuff. And, you know, my mom was like, holding my hand and you know I was a middle schooler and I was like what are you doing you know I'm I'm old enough for you not to do that and when we got back out into the parking lot she was like people were looking at you and I was like what do you mean people were looking at me and she was like people were like looking at you like you didn't belong here um and it was that was like the the moment I was like wow like it's not that I was like wow I'm Asian it was just like you know people really see me as like different than them you know like in a bad way, kind of. And I, it's kind of sad that that's the way I had to realize that. Um, but, you know, West Hartford, I don't experience that on a daily basis like that. But going out in public to a store and, you know, people were staring at me. My sister sisters noticed it. My mom noticed it. Um, so, yeah, it was just a really telling mo uh, moment. Ma Maya, did you want to chime in? Um, I think that I've always kind of known, like, since I was able to, like, coherently think that, like, I was different from other people, just because obviously I look different, and we are in, like, a predominantly white society. Um, and so I guess people have always treated me differently. And it might not be like the very, like, large remarks that Nathan was talking about. But just like little things like kind of like subtle exclusion, or little comments, like, I think I was in middle school and I was on the side for a soccer game and this couple asked me, where are you from? You look very exotic. And <laughs> they used the word exotic. And I was that just that moment. I was like, people don't think of me as they do my white peers. Um, and that's kind of when I knew, like, I always knew like my life wasn't going to be like my white peers, but that's just kind of when I was really aware of how people perceived me. Um, and there was a, also a moment like as young as kindergarten and where we, every single class was dressing up as Native Americans and pilgrims, which is already controversial enough. Um, and this one kid said to me that I should dress up as an Indian. He was referring to Native Americans because I was Indian and not white. And first of all, discerning between being Indian and Native American was already really confusing for me as a five-year-old um, because of how people portrayed it. And uh, I was also very aware of how different I looked and how people even in the youngest grade would categorize me. Um, and so obviously we were children and I don't blame them because it's kind of society that's allowed them to grow up 
with being ignorant of other ethnicities and cultures, but it definitely affected me as a child and made me realize that my life was going to be a little bit harder. <laughs> Great, Mamta. Um, so I know I said it before that I was born in Nepal and I moved here when I was 10. And I know like life here was going to be very different from Nepal. Um, so the minute I walked into Duffy Elementary School, um, I knew that I was different because people were looking at me so differently. So I went to boarding school um, in Nepal and we had like, you know, um, we had outfits that we had to wear. We, I mean, we had uniform for school. So I didn't know how to dress like, you know, like how Americans like dress here. So I was just wearing like, you know, I thought it was fine, just regular pants and white shirt. Um, but I just, like I was getting judged like first day like I knew that I was gonna have a hard time fitting in like in this environment and I which I did um you know later in the um, year I was bullied um and it just sucks because like you know uh, English wasn't my native um, language and I was having like you know hard time expressing how I felt to teachers and like I just felt like wow like I don't have anyone here um and like there wasn't like anyone like you know asking me like okay like are you okay like you know how are you fitting here like do you like it here there was no one to ask that and like I can't come back home you know telling my parents like you know I'm going through this and that because they're not going to be able to understand because they didn't go to school here and they don't know how it works um but that was like the first time like you know I'm not yeah that was the first time where I like felt like okay I am different and I, I you know I'm different from everyone and it's going to be hard for me to uh, fit in. And then after that, um, I think college was another time where I had like, you know, like, you know, it's like, I know I'm Asian American, but like people made me feel like I'm Asian American. Um, so like every time I would introduce myself, like, oh, I'm, I'm like, my name is Manta. And then they would say like, oh, that's a beautiful name. How, how do you like, where is it from? Like, you know, how do you say it? Um, and then I would say, like, you know, I'm from, like, West Hartford, Connecticut. And then they're like, no, where are you from? And then I'm like, it, like, it, I'm from Nepal. And then I, and then they go, well, I've never heard of that. Like, where is that? And then I'm like, well, Nepal is right between India and China. Like, it's a small country. So just, like, having to explain that, like, I know, like, people, like, sometimes they don't mean it in, like, a negative, like, you know, connotation. It's just, like, they're just curious. So like, but like just having to explain that sometimes is just like frustrating because I don't want to explain, you know, uh, but yeah. Yeah. And so the two, like Maya and Mamta, you have uh, both brought up this, this question that we, I think, have all been asked before, right? Of the, where are you from? No, no. Where are you really from? And um, in, in, in over the years, I've, um, practiced many different responses to it. <laughs> um, but, you know, how do you, as immigrants, but also as U.S., you know, like born here, um, you know, American citizens, how do you address some of those questions that you get? Um, Natalie? Yeah, I think this this is my favorite question because this is something that's not talked about. Enough. And it's a question that I find so interesting because it for me, it definitely depends on the context. I recognize that I look very racially ambiguous, especially in the summer when I'm tanner and things like that. And so when I it depends on the setting for me. So whenever I go to the nail salon, they always ask me that, but they ask me in like a genuine way, like, oh my gosh, like, where are you from? Like, maybe we're from like the same place. They ask me in a genuine way. And so then I tell them, you know, my father's from the Philippines. But if it's somebody like, for example, in elementary school, like my and Mamta were talking about, I went to Duffy as well. I also wanted to say that that was a very interesting experience because it was very predominantly white and I think that all students of color face some sort of bullying at Duffy which was really sad and I hope that it's not like that today but um yeah when students at Duffy would be like oh like where are you from then well I guess I didn't have the smarts to do this in elementary school but let's say somebody from Connard said it like that I would just be like oh like I live, I'm like, I live right near Connor. Like I, I'm from West Hartford. Like I was born in New Jersey. 
So it definitely depends on the context of the situation and the intentions of the person, because sometimes people are just genuinely curious. And um, especially for me, I understand like if you're just genuinely curious and I wouldn't, if a random stranger asked me that also, which has happened multiple times because of, I think Maya said this, the whole exotic thing. That is just, I don't know how people have the confidence to just go up to somebody and be like, wow, you're so exotic. But that does happen. And then they get hit with the, I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know it's like, it's like a rite of passage for, I think our community, like the, you know, where are you really from? And like the lunchbox incident um, <laughs> and the exotic, if you're female, like there are very common storylines in our lives. <laughs> Anyone else <laughs> interested in answering where are you really from, <laughs> Tiffany? <laughs> so when I was little, um, like my grandma used to make me lunch all the time and it was always something like that was Vietnamese. And I remember like my, I think my resentment towards being Vietnamese kind of started in like when I was really little, when people would start pointing out that it was different or like, just like how Natalie and Mamtha were saying, like when people would ask me where, where I was from, it almost seemed like they were warranting, like they, they need, I needed to justify just being Vietnamese, like that I wasn't something else, like that I wasn't white or something. And I always felt like, like I needed to kind of like, find some alternative to just say like, well, I'm just Vietnamese because my parents, like they moved here. Sorry. Like I wasn't born here. And I always like kind of struggled with finding that balance between like feeling proud of my culture. And then like, at the same time, I like, I was just confused about who I was because I was born here. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, it's definitely a confusing question to be asked. And I remember in elementary school, which is when I was first asked that question, I wasn't really sure how to answer. I just said I was from Canada. And then, of course, you get asked, where are you really from? And then I have to explain where my parents are from, which wasn't the question they asked me. But I guess now that I'm older, I have the guts to just say, well, I'm from Canada. And then I just stay quiet. And if they want to ask more and get an uncomfortable silence, then they can do that, I guess. <laughs> That's the best way to go, I think. <laughs> Just put it back on them. <laughs> you make it awkward. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, as someone that is in a different, you know, age <laughs> bracket, um, just hearing all these similar stories of current day youth going through what we went through too. And, you know, sometimes I'm such... Um, a glass is very half empty person. <laughs> and it gives me these moments of, oh my gosh, like it still hasn't progressed. But then, you know, seeing you on this panel, just openly and honestly talking about these things, I think we didn't necessarily have that forum. So I'm just glad that, you know, you're so open and honest and happy to talk about these things, which are hard to do. Um, but I, I see that change in, in our community's ability to really vocalize and start talking and start really um, trying to get at, you know, how do we change that, right? So that other kids don't have these experiences at school. Um, and so, you know, a lot of you talked about your experiences in elementary school and how Sometimes it was not the best. And um, even in college where you felt some of these experiences, um, you know, what were there areas throughout school where um, you were able to see yourself, you know, whether it's reflected in the, the educators or in the curriculum or like Sarah said, right, there's a lot more books now that um, include authentic characters and not just the sidekick. Um, so, you know, tell me a little bit more about, you know, day to day. What do you see, Maya? Well, just growing up in the West Hartford school system, um, Asian American culture, I think in my experience was rarely ever reflected. Um, the first time I had a teacher, 
um, who looked like me was in seventh grade at Bristol Middle School. Um, and other than that, I have never had another teacher that was minority um, in all my years at Conard or and Duffy and Bristow. Um, and regarding the curriculum, um, it's just very minimal in our school system in our in, in the history classes that we're teaching. I'm pretty sure we went over Asia in seventh grade, but also not in depth. And I remember a lot of the curriculum being aimed at issues in these countries, which is okay because obviously they need to be ha- held accountable, but completely ignored a lot of the culture and diverse traditions that is so deep and rich in Asia. And I think that one of the reasons that Asian Americans are often not fully appreciated or understood is because of this, because kids aren't learning about the different cultures and they become ignorant to it. And so I really do wish that these schools, especially in high school, um, have the option to take the AAPI courses, which I know is a bill right now, um, going through the um, Senate and the House. So I really think that that would be really essential to get into our schools. Great, Natalie. Uh, I just wanna echo what Maya said, but it actually took 12 years for me to get my first teacher that looks like me. I'm very thankful to have Ms. Peretti, who is gonna be on the panel next week. She is an amazing teacher, an amazing person. The first day I walked into her class, I had never seen her before, didn't know her. So when I walked into her class and I saw her, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then when I went home, cause I was too nervous to say it to her in person, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm sorry if this is personal, but I think you're Asian and it's so awesome to have a teacher that looks like me and she was like this is the best email I've ever received and like I went right to tell my mom like it was so exciting but then at the same time it was really sad that I was that excited just to have a teacher that looks like me like that's something I was saying to all my white friends I was like this is something that you guys don't even think about like you've all had teachers that look like you and it has taken me 12 years in the school system to get one teacher that looks similar to me just the same race not even the same ethnicity the same race and so that was really crazy to me and then another thing that Maya was mentioning about the curriculum right now one thing that I hate 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 is that you can take AP U.S. history standard U.S. history or U.S. history through the African-American experience and I hate that because why isn't the African-American experience included in AP U.S. history? Why aren't other minority cultures included in U.S. history? Why do I have to choose between a more academically rigorous course and something that actually highlights half of America? And it just, that really bothers me. And I'm, I think that when they include AAPI courses in curriculums, they need to make sure that they are built in to standard and AP and honors. I know that College Board handles AP curriculum, but um, into all the courses so that students don't have to choose between learning about their culture and taking a class that's on level with their academics. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, that, you know, Asian American history is US history, right? as is, right, like the African-American experience history and, you know, Latinx and Hispanic, like that is all a part of U.S. history. Um, And just like we are doing this panel in May because it's AAPI Heritage Month, like we if we did this in September, like it shouldn't be an issue, right, in the long run. (laughs) Um, And so I think we just need to keep in mind that, yes, like it's great to have these highlights but it really needs to be embedded in our day to day um, in every layer. So thank you, Mamta. Go ahead, Mamta. Um, I also love Ms. Pratty and she was my first um, Asian teacher also. Um, Yeah, I love her so much. She actually proofread my college essay as well. Um, And I still I'm still in touch with her through Facebook. So we talk here and there. And I love that like she's impacting so many students. I think like every student can vouch how amazing she is. So I'm so happy that like she's in the panel next week. Um, I agree with everything that Natalie and Maya said about um, what to be added. Um, I want to touch on a different thing. I think financial literacy should be something that should be added um like in high school because let me 
like so i went through college and i now i work for um student support services it's a department that represents underrepresented students in higher education so low income uh, minority group and let me tell you like there are so many students that have no idea what kind of loans to take out you know like what does these loans mean or like just to like budget their financial at all like you know freshman year they're just lost um, and because like they're first gen students and a lot of their families actually have no idea how to like, you know, help them as well. So I think financial literacy should be added in the curriculum. Like, I think that would be really helpful to all students in general, I think. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The systems are very different, right? Um, even in, you know, just trying to access higher ed, sometimes in different countries, it's very low cost, right? Mm -hmm. But here, the amount of loans, there's federal, there's private, like it is a very confusing system. Um, so thank you for that, Mantha and Sarah. I definitely agree with what Mantha just said, um, especially since I think for a lot of us, our parents are immigrants and didn't go through um, the United States college like, application process. Like mm -hmm. personally, I have to do a lot of my FAFSA myself. Yeah. And same. I do think that a lot of students are put in a position where they have to, or I guess they don't have any room in their schedule to take financial literacy, which is why it's really important to have it there. Because often the students who need it the most are the ones who feel pressured to load up their schedule with other classes and not take it. And I also wanted to go back to what Natalie said about um, how there is, are like no AP classes focusing on the Asian American, or not even the Asian American, just even the Asian experience across the continent. And I think, I'm not sure if this has changed, but the last time I looked at it, I don't think there even exists AP Asian history or AP African history or AP Latin American history, which if it was just AP US history, it would be, I guess, okay, because College Board is an American company, but we also have AP European history. And I think it's really odd that the only time that any of these other countries are mentioned is when we've been colonized by Europe and the United States or had our governments overthrown by Europe and the United States. So I think when the students see Asian and African and Latin American nations represented only in those ways, only when we're being, I guess, oppressed and taken over by predominantly white nations, it skews their views of what we are and what our backgrounds are. So we really do need classes like that that center on, I guess, not just when we've been oppressed or taken over, but also the years and years and years of history we have. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And when it is controlled by a corporation, basically, right, and deciding <laughs> what is worthy of studying, um, yeah, it gets a little skewed um, in that, you know, again, like you said, right, like the, the lack of understanding of our experiences in the U.S., leads to things like that you've been mentioning of, you know, the, the perpetual foreigner, right? You're always getting asked where are you really from? Like, no, really, where are you really from? Um, and things like the model minority myth, you know, that is really pervasive um, in our culture in the US where, you know, there's a perceived um, lens on the Asian population that we are all smart and, you know, high achieving. And as we saw from the data, and as we see on this screen here, that is not the case, right? We are such a, a diverse group of people. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to, like, trying to combat some of these perceptions from the outside, um, like the perpetual foreigner or the model minority. Um, and especially I think as high school seniors at this point, right? Like I'm sure you've had encounters where educators and other students assume things about you as Asians. Um, and so how do you, you know, without sacrificing your own academic achievement and integrity, like how do you combat that model minority myth? Um, Tiffany, did you wanna take this one? Yes, I can. Um, I remember like a lot of my friends, and a lot of my teachers almost had this assumption that I would be very good at math. And, you know, I would say I'm like an above average math student, but I'm definitely not like exceptionally 
whatever. I'm not up to the assumption that they think I am. And so I think it's definitely difficult to kind of um, like suggest that you're not, you don't fall under that category without negating your personal abilities and stuff. And um, I think that when students and like friends can perpetuate that assumption, it just enforces us and feels us to be like pressured to even fit in even more. And I think that that is where people tend to kind of stray away from who they really are and start shaping into what society wants them to reflect. And I think that in order to kind of stop that from occurring is when we just speak up and start saying like, you know, I'm not actually that good at math, you know, like, I don't like it when you ask me if, if I can help you. So yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you for that honesty. I was placed in a AP Calc class and I was like, I think I was placed very like wrong. <laughs> All right, Nathan. Um, something that I, I mean, I kind of just do because I like it, but it also works for this as you know, showing success in other areas. I mean, I feel like we shouldn't have to do that. I mean, the myths just shouldn't exist. Um, but you know, because of it, it's, it's almost reducing, um, Asians, you know, like a box, like you can, you can be this, you can't be this, you know, like you can be a doctor, you can't be a performer, you know? Um, so I guess showing success, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say like, I'm successful in what I do. Um, but you know, like doing, you know, theater and stuff, something that's not, you know, um, considered what, an Asian would do, you know, within that myth. Um, I feel like that's help, like helping like destroy it, I guess. It's, you know, changing the narrative, like putting it in your own hands, showing success in another category. Great. Thank you. Yeah. You start to like rebel kind of a little bit against your, you know, what you want to be. Um, but yeah, no, these are, these are hard truths to hear. All right, Natalie. Nathan, yeah, that is such a good point and such a unique perspective that you bring because Asians are historically underrepresented in the arts. So I'm very happy that you are successful. He didn't want to say that he's successful, but he is very successful. Um, and I was just going to say that uh, the model minority myth is really harmful to students with special needs um, because if you're automatically assumed to be smarter or more talented or something, but you need accommodations to to reach your full potential you might not you might not receive them because people assume that you can do it on your own or you don't need them or nothing's wrong like you you should be good at it like you're fine and so i think that can definitely be extremely harmful to special needs students or low income students and something else i wanted to say that i feel like momto you would be really good at answering is that going through the college application process this year i was worried that being Asian was going to be held against me because as we know, um, especially the Ivy Leagues, they had a big scandal where it was found out that they were being discriminatory against Asian Americans and holding them to higher standards than they were other races. Um, so I was scared that uh, that was going to affect me. And I don't know, maybe Mom, you can talk about that more. But um, I think that in the college admissions process and everything, the model minority myth has definitely taken has had like a huge effect on the admissions process that has actually taken it because a lot of people think the model minority th myth helps Asian Americans, but in that case, it's really hurting them. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for bringing um, the disparity between, you know, who gets identified for the special ed services um, and who doesn't, you know, and as we know, right, like the, the black and brown students are identified more to be in special education than Asian American students. Um, and, you know, it, it goes both ways, right? Like this, this positive stereotype has a negative impact. And also this negative stereotype of who's being identified for special ed is also having such a negative impact on all the wonderful student achievement that's actually happening too. Um, and it is complicated. This <laughs> education system. It is, it is definitely not a neutral ground. Um, Maya? Um, I just want to add on to what Nathan said. I completely agree with what he's saying because, well, first off, placing Asian Americans as economically successful, automatically smart, 
that downplays a lot of the issues that they do go through in society. Um, racism against um, Asian American Pacific Islanders and their struggles is significantly downplayed um, because of the stereotype. Uh, just because Asians are economically successful, and as we saw, like there is a lot of like we're a diverse group. Not a lot of people are not. Um, doesn't mean that they aren't suffering from social inequality and hatred and the hate crimes that we see rising. Um, and so that's another harm, I think, of this myth. And then going off of what he said about placing us in a box, um, they say, yeah, you can be great at school, but then in things as sports, we are automatically like they, they see us like at tryouts and they're like, no, they can't be good at sports. And so as a student athlete, I've had to work 10 times harder than my peers to be recognized. And it's been a struggle um, to have to work that much harder to be recognized. Great, Manta. Yeah, um, I, I agree with um, what everyone was saying. Um, just to add on um, is that it's like mentally exhausting. It's like draining uh, when you like, have all these stereotypes that like we have to live up to or like all these expectations that we have to live up to it's very exhausting it's so draining and the crazier part is that mental health is such a stigma in asian communities of most of the asian communities and like we can't even like share about like our struggles that we go through with our own family and the fact that like people just expect you to be successful and like just smart and just like you know just be perfect honestly the mo like model um minority myth like just expects you to be like perfect like you you're like put in a box and you know like and you can't get out of it and it's very exhausting and i just want to emphasize like the mental health um is that like i think we need to raise awareness in mental health in asian american communities because um, a lot of Asian American students actually go through it, but there's no one that's actually speaking out on it. And it would be amazing if Board of Education actually provides resources for students, you know, like, for example, having counselors that look like you or like, you know, that can, can relate to what I was going through. Like when I was applying to colleges, Okay, so back little backstory. My dad didn't want me to go to Yukon like Stores Campus. I was accepted to Stores Campus. You know, everyone else would be so happy to go to uh, Stores Campus, but my dad didn't want me to go there because, like, first of all, like you know, he's new to the whole college life, and he didn't want me to go away like and live up there. So he wanted me to go to Harvard Campus, and I had no one to back me up. I was like fighting through it and it was mentally exhausting trying to explain that to my dad like why it's so beneficial for me to go to stores and I don't want to be home um so like you know times like that and I know there's a lot of like Nepali students like at Connor and Hall right now going through the same situation and other Asian Americans where they're just exhausted you know like kind of standing up for themselves um and which is why like you know I started this um I'm like, I feel like I'm rambling, so feel free to stop me. Um, I started this um, nonprofit organization, which is Sagarmatha Harford Leo Club, which I started with a few of my West Harford friends and like um, friends from Brantford, because there's a large uh, Nepali population in both communities. Um, and we actually had a panel. Um, we had like a bunch of students coming in and talking about like mental health and why you know, why we need to raise awareness because a lot of time, like it doesn't get rec recognized in our community. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, and, you know, as a parent of a newly minted teenager, like these are all things that I need to hear so that I can make sure that as, you know, we go through right the, the growth process that I need to really open my eyes and adjust and, you know, give myself the tools to try to support mental health, to support, you know, not putting her in a box, like to support all these things. So thank you. It is a great parenting lesson for me to hear everyone talk about your, you know, your experiences. Um, and so, like you said, Mamta, like, thank you for bringing up, you know, what are some of the things that, that 
that we as Asian American, you know, community members and students need, um, you know, what, what else, right? You said um, access to mental health or social works that look like us or um, in making sure that, that things like um, guidance and social work and all these students support um, be culturally um, responsive as well. Um, you know, just because I'm Asian, right, doesn't mean that I can necessarily speak to the Nepali experience. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think, you know, if there are other solutions, or if there are other um, ways that you wish your schooling was different, um, you know, let us know, like, the now's the time. <laughs> Natalie? Um, I was, another thing about Ms. Freddy, because she is the only, besides, there's another teacher at Conard who is Asian, but she's the Chinese teacher, and I've never had her. I don't teach Chinese, so I never will have her. Um, but I just, I wish that there was more representation, not just in guidance, but in all fields, because I feel like a lot of students, they grow connections with their teachers, and they they can go to their teachers for things that they might not go to guidance for because of those connections. Because like when you see a teacher every day or with the block schedule every few days, um, you get to know them a lot better than you get to know your guidance counselor. So you're more likely to go to them about um, personal issues or something like that. And so having teachers that look like us would be beneficial not only for academic purposes, but also for um, social emotional learning. Thank you. Any other, you know, the dream, like what, you know, <laughs> what is like the best schooling to you? What does it look like? Um, what do you wish you had um, that is equitable to, you know, all students going through some of these things? Sarah? I think it's important for, I guess, especially elementary school teachers to like look out for, um, or any racism or racist events happening around their elementary school. Because I remember this, I don't know if any of you guys like also experienced this, but I remember back when I was um, like in fifth grade at Bugby when I moved there, there's this like song where like people would sing like Chinese, Japanese, Asian and like pull their eyes back. And I was like, I was so shocked. I did not know how to respond. And it would have been great if somebody else had like stepped up because I was way too uncomfortable to say anything. And then like, I thought that was just like maybe my class because that was like a super white class. I was like one of the only Asian kids there. But then like I asked my brother, like, have you ever heard that song? And he was like, oh yeah, like people sing that song still. And I was like, like even today people are singing that really like weird racist song. And just like, I think it would really helped if teachers paid a little bit closer attention to what was happening around there because I don't think they were singing it too quietly. Like it's pretty easy to hear. So it was either like ignored or just not addressed, which is something that, it really should be addressed because that can have a really like significant impact on kids that age. And yeah, my heart just breaks hearing these stories, Nathan. Um, I mean, I, this is kind of, I don't want to say like an obvious thing, but like, I feel like a lot of people in West Hartford kind of neglect that racism still exists here, which is like crazy to me. Cause it's like, you know, I understand, you know, we live in a great town, you know, um, we are a very diverse town, you know, um, I feel like West Hartford does a, an adequate job of seeing all identities. Um, you know, I think that we have a lot of work um, amplifying all of those voices, but I do think that we have um, a diverse and accepting community. I've never felt unsafe living in West Hartford. Um, yet at the same time, like Sarah just said, stuff like that happens in the elementary schools. It's like, I don't think people realize that, you know, just because, you know, we're a left leaning, you know, progressive town doesn't mean that stuff doesn't still happen. So, you know, I think like panels like this is, um, it's like when these stories come out, you know, through the roots and stuff. So I think it's important to keep having conversations about it um, in the public eye and, you know, through the public, I guess, so that I guess West Hartford just becomes a little bit more aware of all the issues that still happen. Right, yeah, and racism, I think, looks different in different communities. Um, and I think, you know, over the last year, um, the racist violence against our community has skyrocketed, and that has really, I think, awakened people's um, 
understanding of what anti, you know, like uh, not understanding, but that, that anti-Asian racism exists. Right. But it was through like these really violent acts, but racism shows up right in those really small moments on the playground, you know, as there's an adult like 10 feet away and these kids are singing um, or just that, you know, that the, the education is not representative of including um, Asian stories and Asian American stories and, you know, and the, the positive parts of it, right? Like someone said about it's, it's only shows up when it's about like, you know, being colonized or oppressed and, um, and always through that, that European or the white lens. Um, it's so hard hearing that even though you guys are, <laughs> Um, much younger that you are still having or have had all these experiences that, you know, many of us have had growing up too. And, and what do we need to do? Like, what, what are some other ways, right? Outside of this panel, um, can we do to just really start combating more of the systemic things, um, which hopefully will then take care of some of the more individual things. But, um, you know, what, what else, Mamta? Um, I think like, just like, um, just, um, you know, creating an environment, like where it's like open space, um, you know, like telling kids that, you know, it's okay to be not okay, you know, you know, like, let them talk like create an environment like have a check-in with your students you know where you're just open like you're just talking about random stuff like you know sometimes it doesn't always have to be academic you know we don't know what the student is going through at home um so like just like creating a space uh where students can talk talk about issues um you know and like talk about things that they're going like going through home like reach out like you know sometimes students like you know don't want to reach out or tell you what you're going through um so maybe like try reaching out and see like if like sometimes when you offer a hand like you know you, they usually accept it um so i think just like you know creating a space and like just like i said before like you know just providing a lot of resources for mental health um i think through COVID last year especially um I think students have gone through a lot um, and I think it's really good to like just check in with students. Great. Yeah. That just that personal outreach and connection, because it is hard, right. To be mm -hmm. the one that has had a bad experience to, to say, Hey, I need help. Mm -hmm. um, it really does help when someone else is like, Hey, what's going on. Right. And really right. reaching out and listening and, and um, creating space for you, Maya. Yeah. Um, and I think in West Hartford, teachers have been trying a lot to reach out more and try to address some of the stuff that's happening in society. But also, there have been instances where it has been the teachers that have been either like unintentionally aiding to these biases um, or saying kind of harmful comments and singling you out because of your race or because you look different. Um, and I know a lot of the times it isn't intentional, but it's these internal biases and prejudices that we have to address. Um, like, for example, a teacher could ask you where you're from um, and kind of perpetuate that stereotype, which I think they need to start actively addressing and checking themselves so that they can provide the same kind of environment for every student. Thank you, Tiffany. I would like to applaud like West Hartford education for starting this community thing where we meet every week and just talk about more contemporary issues. And I think that it's become really apparent this year that teachers are starting to, you know, start that conversation about um, how we as a generation specifically, like this age group, how we're going to combat like the systematic um, mm -hmm. racism. And I think that especially last year, that is when it kind of started becoming introduced. Like I know my teacher always says like, you guys are going to be the ones who are going to fix this. And I think that that is really uplifting to hear. And especially it's enforced when we start that conversation about how we can, you know, fix these little microaggressions. And I know like 
at the peak of Asian American violence, um, we did have a really important community discussion that um, I know a lot of students kind of felt that it can be a little bit inorganic and kind of forced upon us. But I think that when things like this occur and it's more natural, that's when we kind of make real progress and get a real conversation going on. Great. Yeah. And it's really uplifting, right? That, you know, <laughs> that you are starting to, um, not starting, because I think many of you are way more experienced in this like activism and organizing space that even I, as a, I'm going to reveal that I am 40 plus. Um, <laughs> but it, it is, it's, you know, I just have so much hope, right? Even though we've had so much of the downer this year um, and in the, in the past. Um, and so how has your um, identity as an Asian American um, influenced or um, helped and contributed to some of your volunteerism or activism? Um, you know, work in solidarity with other communities um, and, you know, here in West Hartford, all, but also beyond. Um, Nathan? Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm big with theater and, you know, I feel like the arts just in general are a great way to integrate, you know, your identity into, you know, entertainment, I guess. And, um, you know, I kind of, I like to approach a lot of issues in my, I like to write plays at Conard High School. We do a 10 minute play festival, which are a series of, you know, um, comedy 10 minute ish plays. And I've written a few, um, I'm writing what, or, or I'm directing a play right now that I wrote like a full length play. And, you know, I tackle issues of, you know, race and stuff and, you know, comedic light. I feel like that's a very, um, not easy way to start a conversation, but, you know, Sometimes when you like see a joke in the media or something and you laugh at it and then you're like, it, like it gets you thinking, you're like, why did I laugh at that? Is it like, was it like an uncomfortable laugh? Because oftentimes we do laugh at things that are uncomfortable and that's a good way to start a conversation about things. Um, so, you know, I've really tried to integrate, you know, I'm also, I'm gay. Um, <laughs> so I've tried to also, you know, talk about that in my play. I, you know, talk, you know, like religion and how that affects, you know, like, the gay community and you know I've tried to integrate you know small bits of race and how people use certain justifications for you know microaggressions and racism and you know I don't know I just feel like I love the arts and a lot of people are involved in art forms whether it's theater music dance art whatever so I don't know I feel like that's a really good way that all people can not only learn but also contribute so yeah Thank you, uh, Mamta. Um, so um, during when quarantine started um, last year, I actually started my own podcast um, to raise awareness with everything that was happening with BLM and stuff. Um, I saw that our Asian community, um, well, like talking about Nepal community specifically and other few Asian communities uh, weren't speaking up with everything that was happening with BLM. And, um, you know, that kind of like, like, kind of like, you know, it was just like weird, like, why aren't people speaking out? Why aren't like, you know, people being ally and why aren't people like helping out? Um, so I started a podcast, you know, to just raise awareness in our Asian uh, American community. So like my first um, um, podcast was about like BLM and like, you know, how we can be an effective ally and all the history behind like, you know, uh, BLM and like, um, everything. And I continued with it. And I also like, you know, delved into other topics in like our Asian community that like, we kind of like sweep under the rug, like mental health and like, you know, dating interracial, um, dating and all that stuff. Um, so, I mean, like being Nepali has everything to do with like what I do in for a community because I don't want like my younger sisters or like, you know, other younger kids to go through the same thing I go through. Um, and like, I just want to make sure that, you know, they have it better or like, you know, just like educate, um, especially like educate like our older communities as well, because they think that they know everything and they're sometimes not too like, you know, um 
but like sometimes like because they're older they think like you know they have the upper hand and they know better so like it's like just like it was a way to like you know kind of educate like the older community and like the younger community you know this is what happening and this is what we need to do and like that kind of led to the um nonprofit organization as well um where like you know we actually started a mentorship program as well for the nepal community where um where um you know we invited like college alums or like um students who are still in college to kind of guide um the um high school students like who are in like who are juniors and seniors like so say um you know um so i i have a mentor in hall high school you know and she is like a senior and um she's a senior in high um high school and she needs help with like you know what college to apply what kind of scholarship she should apply you know just being in the poly and like applying to colleges she can't go to her parents um so like i'm helping her out um so i mean i love it i it makes me happy helping others and making other people happy so i enjoy it a lot and i hope like the younger generation like kind of like follows the um follows my steps as well great thank you and i'm just going to indicate that it is 8:18 and this is only until 8:30 even though there's so much more information that i would love to like pull out of you guys um but if you know for those of you that are um listening in if you would like to put some questions in the Q&A we may be able to get to them um but i'd love to be able to just continue this you know thread of um um conversation about you know being API and how that impacts the work that we do out in community Natalie Yeah so as i mentioned earlier i've been involved in the political sphere and activism for about uh 5 years now but only in the last few months have i really embraced my asian identity and used that um as part of my activism and i've always been very open about telling my story when it comes to mental health and other experiences but i never really shared my experiences with racism or prejudice or bias or anything until the very recent tragic events and having a place like the protests and the rallies to share my story for the first time where i knew that people would understand and listen was really empowering for me and it really helped me come to terms with my identity and really um understand who i am great thank you uh so much hope and so much um you know in really reflecting on our identities and ourselves um thank you and so you know as we are coming very close to the end of our time together um you know this is a question for everyone on the panel but what's one thing that that you think other community members in West Hartford um could do to amplify the experiences or um you know work with um Asian Americans or you know what are what are what what can community do for us too um and with us um uh Nathan I kind of have two things I mean I feel like we have a great audience tonight that's it's a great turnout I mean like we do community um which is kind of like a homeroom activity at Conard and Hall and I kind of wish like we could m- watch something like this like watch panels like in community there are definitely that we've gotten a lot of feedback about community lessons at Conard and at Hall so it's definitely moving towards the right direction it didn't start in a great place um but I think that having people watch these um would be very very important and the other thing i was thinking about is just support you know your asian youth your asian businesses everything um not to self promo but natalie is starring in a um conard production this spring um which is very exciting for her it's called the chieftain project um and i her debut so <laughs> yeah it is her acting debut and it's very exciting um so yeah like e- like buying a ticket to go see that you know um it's not necessarily about you know the AAPI experience but it's still supporting an AAPI community member which i think is just equally as important so yeah support is huge mamta go ahead um i just want to say like just doing little things um like you know just recognizes re- recognizing and celebrating us like um especially like during like our holidays um you know when i like 
like I like everyone knows that like you know like we have a holiday going on because like we post it on like Facebook like Instagram and everything I, I kid you not there's literally few of my non-American friends that wish me happy holidays you don't even have to say like you know like the Pacific holiday you can just say happy holidays like it's so simple like you know it Eid was like you know last yesterday but like you can just say Eid Mubarak or like happy holidays like you know things like that um it really matters because I go out of my way like to just say Merry Christmas even though I don't celebrate Christmas right or I don't celebrate Thanksgiving but I tell my friends hey like you know a happy Thanksgiving hope you enjoy it with your family even though I don't celebrate it so little things like that so if you have like friends who are Asians and they celebrate different holidays just wish them you know it just it makes their day honestly just that yeah no holidays are a big thing and and oftentimes um, you know, things like Lunar New Year, right, which is celebrated not only by the Chinese community, but Korean and Vietnamese and a huge percentage of our families celebrate that. But that falls a lot of times during mid-year exams. Um, and that is a hard choice to make, right? Like, do I stay at home and celebrate like the largest holiday in our um, family? Or do I go to school and take this test? Um, and these are really hard things to grapple with. And um, you're right, like, it's a big deal. Yeah. Wait, can I just add on to this? Uh, like, my sister, like, literally had an experience in Connard where, you know, she told her teacher that, like, she's celebrating the holiday. And it was in, like, October. Uh, we celebrate Dase, which is, like, our major holiday. And she told her that she can not make it to school um that day and you know instead of like giving her like you know oh you have few days to homework she, she actually got frustrated and mad at her and then told her like she can't have extra days to complete her assignment isn't that crazy but like my sister is so like you know like she's not like the type to stand up for herself she didn't say anything to her um teacher it's like things like that like it just makes me so mad because like we're not asking you for to like, you know, I don't know. It, it just makes me so mad. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I think that on that note, a way that you can support your Asian peers is if you see, for example, somebody posting, even on your Instagram story, oh, like today's Eid, then if you don't know what it is, just taking like maybe 10 seconds to look it up and to find out what it is, this goes for teachers too, like Motlo said. If you're a teacher and you see one of your students email you and they say, um, today's like Naruz, and then you're like, oh, what's Naruz? Instead of just being like, well, your assignment's still due today, you can look it up and find out the history behind it and have a little bit of comp have compassion for people who are looked like different from you. That's a step that I think every teacher can take and every student can take too. Thank you. And that allows us to connect with our heritage and our families and, you know, our community in a different way. Yeah. Thank you. Maya. Uh, I agree with everything that they said. Um, it should go both ways. Uh, I know a lot of us have done a lot to not assimilate, but try to learn about other people's religions and cultures. And I feel like if this was a two way street, we could be a much more accepting society. Um, and so attending youth panels like this and have, attending events to gain more education and knowledge would be really helpful and effective, I think. And then also bringing up the bill again, I, it's Senate Bill 678, actively support it. Oh, it's not 678? Yeah, it's um, 6619. Oh, my bad. Right now, yeah, it's been, um, it's kind of morphed a little bit, but it is 6619 and it's, yeah, to include um, Asian American, um, Native American, LGBTQ, um, I think studies into like a model curriculum for K to eight. So, but it is 6619 and, and like you said, Maya, um, uh, Make Us Visible CT, um, you can find them, right, on Facebook. Is that probably the best way? But really, you know, like, um, even though you might not be of voting age, you are still a constituent um, of, the, you know, of West Hartford, right? And Natalie, you've been involved politically through like the Democratic um, uh, Party and stuff. And so, you know, 
I, there are ways, right, that you can just email your rep, email, um, you know, the people that that represent your area of town. So and thank you, Maya, for bringing that up. Nathan. Something I just want to say really quick is if you have questions, I can't speak for everyone, but like I'm I'm more than welcome to have conversations with people if anyone wants to talk. Um, I mean, like I have a, a drastically different, I think we all have drastically different experiences person by person, but if you ever want to reach out to me, um, I don't know if we can like send our email in the chat or something. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, I am more than welcome to answer them. Thank you for that that open offer, and um, and I think you know for for all of us here, we are definitely um, open to having more conversations um, and connecting with people. Um, but you know, again, like there are the individual touch points that we can do, and with the I four, how do we change the systems and you know practices in place so that you know so many of you are fighting for like your younger siblings to not have to go through this experience right so how do we start to change that um because you know it it really breaks my heart to see and hear that whatever we went through like in the 70s 80s 90s you know that are still repeated to this day um so and and i applaud you all for this eye for a better world for our younger people um, even though you yourselves are young still. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I can't, I can't this is too much, too much, <laughs> but too much of, you know, good stuff too. Um, and any one last final comments before we have to really wrap up, even though I really don't want to wrap up. <laughs> um, and, you know, thank you attendees, you know, for sticking with us this whole entire hour and a half and, and really just openly listening and to our youth and their experience and, and solutions um, that they have put forth and, and how we can start to, to change. But, and, you know, we are definitely, definitely more than what has been done to us and our community, as you saw tonight. Um, and, you know, and again, like, May is a great month to celebrate all that is all that is us. But um, really, you know, we can't celebrate the fullness of us in just one month. And we really do need to continue to have these conversations and have um, have these honest, open uh, experiences um, shown to a community. So thank you again, everyone. Um, and I just really, really appreciate you all on this panel tonight um, for being here. And thank you for the West Hartford Public Library and West Hartford Public Schools and um, the West Hartford Community Interactive for being such great partners and showcasing and providing us with this platform. Um, and if you have any questions, I think if you can email, um, I'm going to put my email or the um, and we can start collecting all this information, but um, I'm just putting the EDI West Hartford EDI email so that if you want to ask any questions for our panelists, um, we can collect it in one place. I know we did not have enough time to take your questions. I'm sure everyone was trying to <laughs> Um, you know, ask all our wonderful youth panelists. So thank you again um, for being here and listening so openly. And thank you panelists for, for sharing in such a public space, some of your challenges, but also some of your celebrated wins. All right. Well, have thank a good you evening. Thank for organizing. You're welcome. Thank you, thank thank you for organizing. Let's do this again next month. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yukio. Thank you. And we hope to see you next week for our second panel. Yes. Have a good weekend, everyone. You too.